Well, I want to welcome our Sunday School class again to our video stream. And I'm glad you're with us today. Looking forward to spending these few minutes with you. And again, I still am looking forward to when we'll be able to be back there teaching in Sunday School in a live situation. But we're being wise. I think this is very wise not to uh, rush it. Uh, but uh, we have to be very, very careful. So I know you understand. But anyway, I'm glad we have this technology and we're able to come to you this way. So we're going to continue our study. Let me encourage you to be praying for those that are in our class that have uh, physical needs and other needs. And may you just keep them and hold them up before God in prayer. Most of those are listed on the website and you can be praying for them. We continue our study today, and uh, we're talking about facing Goliath and being in a spiritual battle, the Goliaths of our life, and uh, today we want to talk about daring to be meek, daring to face Goliath, but daring to be meek is what we're looking at today. So, if you have your Bibles available, let's turn to 2 Samuel 15. And I'm just going to read verses 1 through 6. The story goes on through chapters after this, but we'll refer to some of those. But let's look at these verses, 2 Samuel 15, 1 through 6. It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now remember, Absalom is David's son. So Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Nobody is signed to hear you. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath in any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Well, as we look in these verses of Scripture today and we see Absalom turning on his father, we want to notice that David was a very meek man. And that was always David's characteristic when he was a shepherd boy, when he killed Goliath and, and uh, in other uh, situations with Saul. He always showed himself to be a meek man, and that's a good trait to have, the meekness and sacrificial love that he showed even here toward Absalom shows that he was a meek man. And uh, you and I need to think about that. Uh, we ought to be meek. God expects his children to be meek people, not uh, self-centered, arrogant, proud people, but very humble, very meek people, even leaders. He expects that out of all of us. And so Romans 12.10 says, In honor, preferring one another. Did you get that? In honor, preferring one another. Having a meek spirit and thinking of others before ourselves. And you know who that's like? <laughs> that's like the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, isn't it? So first of all today we look at the crisis, the crisis that we see. And uh, David was king. Uh, he had, David had long since been the authority of the land. God had established this plan. This was God's plan. And uh, of course, as you would know, God, uh, Satan always wants to mess up God's plans. God has a plan that works. Satan doesn't like it. And he wants to have a counter plan. And he always makes that available to us, the children of God. But uh, maybe David was reaping a little bit of what he sowed here. But nevertheless, there was a plan that God had that should not have been violated. 
First Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, mean, mad, aggravated, roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom, fall down and let him run over you? No. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So calmness and contentment can turn into a crisis, can turn into chaos in just a heartbeat. And these things are, of course, generally speaking, they are the result of Satan fighting us and trying to destroy God's plan. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are his everlasting arms. And so when we do have problems, we need to always realize we have God right there with us to take care of these problems. Now, Absalom challenged David. This was his son, and he challenged David. And I'm telling you, he was not innocent in his challenge. He wanted to come off seeming innocent. But look again at verses 2 through 4 of our text. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. That's where all the people were coming in and out. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. He's saying, You're not important, you know. Absalom said unto him, See thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Now he's presenting these things to them that way. And then he kept on saying in verse 4, Moreover, O oh, that I were made, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come to me, and I would do him justice. What he was implying, of course, he was being dis, uh, disloyal. And he made that comment. Basically, he's saying how, how unfortunate no one has been assigned to hear you. And uh, he's really trying to stir up controversy. There's absolutely no, no doubt about that. Now, look at what he says in verse 5. He's trying to draw the people to himself. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. Isn't that something? He was really working hard to get their loyalty. And he might have been acting like, well, I'm just helping my dad. But he really wasn't. It wasn't that at all. He was being disloyal. And these comments show it. And verse 6 says, He stole the hearts of the people. You know, sometimes it should always cause great concern when someone who should be serving the person that is placed over him, when that's, that's the way it's designed, instead usurps loyalty from others. And that can happen in a workplace. I certainly have seen that happen in a church. It can happen in a church. Employees gain their co-workers' confidence and they stand up and fight against the one that God has put in authority and in charge. It may be a deacon. It may be a Sunday school teacher. It could be a layman. Uh, they might uh, imply some things that well, maybe the pastor's too busy for you. He doesn't care that much about you. Or he just doesn't have the leadership skills. I do, and I'm wiser and all of that. The next thing you know, there's discord in the workplace. There's discord in the church and discord in the family. Proverbs 6, 16, and 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are, now notice this word, an abomination. That's serious. That's not fooling around. It's an abomination unto him. Verse 19, one of them he names, he that soweth discord among brethren. You know, God hates that. God hates that. God's word says instead to honor those who are in authority. So David and Saul had that kind of relationship. Uh, Saul mistreated David. 
no question about it. But David realized that Saul was God's anointed. Now, he had a lot of times when he could have done damage uh, to Saul, but he didn't do it. But Absalom didn't have that mindset. Absalom challenged authority and turned the people to himself. Well, that's a problem. Well, David was faced with a dilemma, obviously. Secondly, we see that. Uh, what do you do now, David? He's turning people against you. He's trying to get the throne. And do you fight or do you leave? And David left. He was meek. He let God settle it. That was his attitude. Uh, God will settle it. God will take care of it in his time. Many times in the ministry I've done that, and I've watched God take care of it. But let God settle it in his time. David and the priest, they took the ark and they left, and uh, it exhibited uh, meekness. And it wasn't weakness on David's part. It was meekness. And he exhibited that, and he did it just like he did with Saul whenever he could have taken advantage of Saul. He had been anointed the next king many years before, uh, even during Saul's reign, and at least twice he had Saul completely at his mercy. I mean, he could have killed Saul. He could have done it, but he chose not to harm Saul to let God have his way in the situation. And, of course, you and I know that God took care of that matter. Now, those who knew David best remained loyal with David. They knew his character. They knew he was God's anointed man. And even though things looked bad, they, they had this mindset, because it was God's mindset, you follow God's anointed man. You stay with him. And they stayed with him. In fact, they loaded up all of that, and they went to a place that later on he describes as far off. I mean, it wasn't convenient for them to follow David. But they were doing the right thing. Many times, doing right is not easy. But we have to do right, no matter what the consequences. And there are two examples, I think, here uh, in the Bible that I want to share with you about meek responses. Number one, there's Abraham, or Abram, we would say. Genesis 13, 7-9 there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. That was the attitude of meekness on the part of Abram, and certainly it paid off. Christ is our other great example. Oh, he was meek and lowly. Listen to Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb before the, or to the slaughter, and as sheep before her sharers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. In Matthew 27, 11 through 14, And Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Jesus answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearst thou not how many things they witness against you? And he's saying, Jesus, man, don't you know and what they're saying, and Jesus, he answered him to never a word in so much that the governor marveled greatly. He couldn't believe it. In Luke 23, verse 33 through 35, and when they were come to the place which was called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, one on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they departed his raiment and cast lots, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with him derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, if he be Christ, the chosen one. And then in first Peter two, twenty one through twenty three, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, 
leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin. Listen, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him, that is to the Father, that judgeth righteously. David, like Abraham in Christ, faced the dilemma with meekness. Not weakness, but meekness. And then secondly, we see the conflict. David left Jerusalem. And that's recorded in verse, uh, chapter 16. David left Jerusalem. And then, of course, Absalom ascended to the throne and took the throne. And uh, even as David was going out from that place and Absalom was going on the throne, there was one man that was throwing stones at him, cursing him. His name is Shimei. And uh, yet David held his peace. So here we have the conflict. Absalom going on the throne. David was on the run. In 2 Samuel 16, we read about those outside his inner circle. And they had different responses, those that were not on the inner circle. First of all, there were some friends, just generally considered friends. You know, it's good to have an encourager. And David had an encourager who was a friend by the name of Ziba. Ziba was a servant of Mephibosheth. And you remember the story of Mephibosheth and David making him so welcome. And of course his servant was welcome. But he wanted to be a blessing to David in his bad circumstances. And Ziba provided uh, a, uh, for him transportation uh, he provided food for him. He provided some wine for medicine. And Ziba gave David a real lift. It encouraged David. Boy, we need friends like that. We need to be a friend like that. And notice, uh, notice that there were words that he cared for him, but there was also action. We need to put these two together. And uh, sometimes uh, you may meet somebody, and it may be soon that, you see that needs something, needs some help, and you don't just say, God bless you, I'm praying for you. By the grace of God, if you have the ability to do it, you go help them. You do something that help, help them out. They need a friend. Maybe they're going through great trials. Be there for them and be a friend. James 2, 14 through uh, 18. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and not words? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be you, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? And so he's just saying, Faith is, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. He says it's more than just speaking it, it's carrying it out, and we need to do that. American Frank Reed, uh, if you remember the story, maybe he was held in hostage, terrible thing, in Lebanon for three and a half years. Uh, Frank Reed was, was beaten, brutally beaten, and treated that way for several months. He was blindfolded. He was chained to a wall by himself. When he was released in 1990, he was asked by Time Magazine what the worst experience of his captivity was. This may surprise you, but he responded this way, Nothing I did mattered to anyone. I began to realize how withering it is to exist with not a single expression of caring around. I learned one overriding fact. Caring is a powerful force. If no one cares... You are truly alone. Well, thank God there are some friends that care, and Ziba cared for David, and he encouraged him. But then there are always foes around. You can count on that. And Shimei was a bitter servant of Saul. He was still angry at David, bitterness in his heart. Bitterness is a terrible thing. And he was cursing David and throwing stones at him. And uh, David had a, a nephew by the name of Abishai, and 
He said, let me, let me shut him up. Let me take care of him. I can take care of him. I'll take a few men up there and we'll, we'll stop him. And David said, no, I don't want to do that. David had a very humble response. And a lot of us would have said, yeah, help yourself. Go ahead and do it. Not David. He was being what God wanted him to be. 2 Samuel 16, beginning with verse 10. And the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore thou hast thou done this? Uh, done so. And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine afflictions and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. He said, just leave him alone. Let it, let it go its way and don't go out there and have vengeance. And Christ says in Matthew 5, 38 and 39, some of the hardest and most powerful verses in the Bible for us to accept. Ye have heard that it had been said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. In Christ's own meekness and suffering is shown. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He, he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears are dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. How do we react when we are mistreated or abused for no good reason? How do we react? Are we meek about it or are we different? Well, Absalom, now we look at it, he's on the throne. The enemies are glad. They probably say, well, David got what he deserved or there must be some sin in his life. And they were glad about it. But you know, it reminds me of Job. <laughs> he was supposedly had uh, three friends, Eliphaz uh, and uh, uh, Bildad and Abihu. They were supposed to be his three friends. But they questioned him. And they, uh, they were saying, the reason you're having all these problems, Job, is you're just hiding sin. You've got sin in your life. I wonder sometimes, don't we judge others like that? We shouldn't do it. A lot of times we question their motives, and we should not do that. It's wrong to question their motives. Prejudice is described as an opinion formed without due knowledge of the facts and circumstances attending the question. And many times we just jump to conclusion. Somebody said the greatest exercise Baptist has is they have is they jump to conclusions. Well. I don't know about that, but I know sometimes we do. And we have to be careful. Absalom is on the throne, but David is, is uh, to Absalom still a threat. And so uh, he wants to do away with David, and he has two plans. We see two plans that are put forth. One is by Ahithophel. And by the way, Ahithophel was one of the closest friends of David, but he turned on him. Have you ever had that happen? Boy, it hurts, I'll tell you. I've had that in the ministry. People I've helped won the whole family to the Lord and over nothing they completely turn against you. I've seen that happen, but Ahithophel did that. Well, Ahithophel said, I've got the answer. Give me 12,000 of the strongest men and we'll go after him. I'll take care of it and let's leave today. But God had somebody else there in place by the name of Hushai. And Hushai was sort of working undercover for David. Uh, God had him there. And uh, he, gave, he, gave, uh, uh, he gave Absalom this information. He said, let's wait a little while and uh, let's raise an army and then you're so great, you raise that army and you lead them. You're so marvelous is basically what he was saying to him. And so he appealed to Absalom's pride. Second Samuel 17, 14. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. See, God was in charge the whole time. And David knew that. And David said, let's wait on the Lord. Often that's the case. Man proposes, but God disposes. 
And always, I promise you, God has the final word. David left vengeance in the hands of God. And what we, you and I need to do always is do right, allow God to take care of the results. Let him take care of the results. I remember in my first pastorates, uh, pastorates there was a man in the church that had sort of run the church and uh, very, very influential. And uh, he got very angry at me uh, over really nothing uh, and uh, really took issue at, with me. I remember being in bed. I hadn't been pastor very long, and he really got angry uh, about something that wasn't important. And uh, there was a young man over there, a Sunday school teacher. He called me. I was in bed, 104 temperature, sick, very sick. And he said, you need to come over here and... This particular man had kept the Sunday school class in the auditorium, and he was really uh, telling the people they ought to get rid of me and so on and so forth. And uh, then later on, that's just one thing, but later on, we were in a teacher's meeting, and the Sunday school superintendent uh, said, now, are there any more questions? And he was a Sunday school teacher. And he stood up and said, yes, I want to know when we're going to get rid of this preacher we've got. And so uh, the, the Sunday school superintendent looked at me and I just held my hands up like this, pray, brother, pray. <laughs> and so he led in prayer. Well, to make a long story short, this man, uh, his son surrendered for the ministry under my pastoring. And he told him, get out, of the, get out of the house you built on the property and burn the bridges behind you, you're not coming back. And then his daughter uh, said to me at one time, I don't know what's wrong with my dad. I think he's losing his mind. And the man who uh, was saying that I was liberal, I was liberal for nothing really like that, left and as a lay preacher took a denominational, very liberal, not a Baptist church even, but a very, very liberal denominational church and began to pass it. Oh well, those things happen. But you know what? God took care of it. I just kept praying, kept waiting, let God have his way and his will and his time, and God took care of it, and it all worked out. Well, thirdly, we look at the conclusion. Our time's getting away from us. We look at the conclusion. As um, uh, was said many times by old Paul Harvey, now for the rest of the story. Well, Absalom is on the throne now, and Absalom was very proud, and he was especially proud of his long hair. Uh, very proud of it, and uh, he would have it cut once a year, and it weighed, in our weight, it weighed three pounds. And he idolized his, his hair. He was a pretty boy. Uh, he liked being that way, and he really thought he was something because of that. And that was, uh, that was something that gave him great pride. But you know what? The very thing that gave him great pride was the very thing that later brought him down to destruction. Well... Now we come to the conclusion, Absalom, we're going to see him in the grave. Absalom has a plan, and he's going to go after David in a great way. Well, Hushai tells David. He comes and gets the word to David. David divides his men into three different groups, and um, David tells all of them before they divide up and everything, I have one command for you. This shows again his meekness. He said, deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. He said, be gentle with him. In other words, he was still going to forgive him and, and help him, but he said, be gentle with him. The Bible describes a battle as a great slaughter when David's men destroyed Absalom's army and an even greater number were destroyed at a place by, uh, the, the army was destroyed by a place in a place because of the terrain described as the wood of Ephraim. And so, you see, the Lord was involved in that, and the Lord fought for David. The Lord was on the throne. Absalom jumped on a mule and began to flee. And when he did, the scriptures indicate that his head caught hold of the oak and, uh, and left him sort of dangling there between heaven and earth, as the Bible says. The historian, Jewish historian Josephus said that, uh, that he believes completely that it became, his hair became entangled 
in Absalom's good looks and his lux luxurious locks were certainly doing him no good at this juncture, to be sure. His pride got him. Well, there was also a loyal, loyal follower of David. A servant saw it, and uh, he went and uh, told David, his name was Joab, he, well, I mean, he told Joab, this, this was an unnamed servant, he told Joab, and Joab was supposed to do what David had told him to do. And uh, he said, uh, on this occasion, I would have given you ten shekels of silver and a girdle if you had killed him, he said to the, uh, the uh, servant of David that was unnamed here. And so uh, that could have ended the battle, I guess, and all of that and the problems, but um, this particular servant said, I would not kill him for a thousand shekels because I heard what the king said. He said, I know what the king said. The king said, don't do it, and I'm not going to do it. 2 Samuel 18, 5. Now, he didn't care about money. He didn't care about fame. His main thrust was, I know what the king said, and that's what I want to do. And friend, you and I ought to be loyal followers of Christ, and we need to keep his commandments. The Bible says that we should do that. And Proverbs 4, 4, he taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. In John 14, 15, keep, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so that's what we should always be willing to do. Then there's always a disloyal follower. Joab broke the trust, and Joab uh, hit Absalom right in the heart with three darts, and it finished him off, it killed him. Now he had no right. He had no right on his own to overrule the king. The king had given the order, but he did. And he rebelled. You know, we sometimes, people today, we do the very same thing. The king is God, Jesus. And he tells us what to do and what not to do. And we think we, can, we're, we know more than him. And we can overrule him. That's what happened like Pharaoh. In Exodus 5, 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Sometimes we act the very same way, and we've got to obey the Lord. And then David now is on his throne. He's back on his throne. We'll go and jump to that. And uh, we see Absalom is dead, and David he was very broken hearted. He mourned. He didn't want that. He wanted to have him come back and forgive him. And uh, yet David realized, I guess, that he was continuing to maybe reap some of the results of his sin. But again, on this occasion, he used meekness and God worked it out. He said, I'm going to wait on God and we'll be meek about it and let God handle it. How many times would we solve our problems correctly without fighting and fussing and feuding if we just let wait on God and let God handle it? Maybe in a marriage situation or whatever. Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, happy, blessed, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, meekness is not weakness. It really isn't. And it's just a matter of God's timing with David as believers, you and I need to be sure that we are responding to trials and to problems in a way that is both God-led and God-honoring, and God will get the glory out of all of these things. Meekness is not weakness. Well, let's dare to be meek. God will bless that, friend. Our time is up. Thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you uh, in another video uh, broadcast or giving that to you, but we really look forward to seeing you at church again very soon. God bless you. If there's anything we can do to help you out, give us a call. We love you. We're praying for you. And help us to be aware, made aware of any problems, sicknesses, or whatever you have. Just give me a call, and uh, I'll appreciate it. God bless you now.